Hi, this is Paul Tanner and welcome to another edition of Health Innovators and very pleased to welcome today we have Joe Brewer from Adapt Immune. Joe, welcome. Uh, thanks very much. Good to be here. So I often like to start with a bit of the backstory before we dive into what you're doing now. So tell me a bit about your background, your career, how you got to your current role and what got you really excited about science and specifically what you're, you're working on right now? So if I go right back to the beginning, I mean, the thing that excited me about science in, in the very early days was just watching stuff change colour and, you know, making bangs and chemistry was really my thing at school. I had a really great chemistry teacher who made it exciting and engaging. And, you know, that whole inquiry as to, well, why does this happen? Why does this happen when you add this to this? Why does it go purple? Why is you know, all of that kind of curiosity was really sparked early on at school. Um, and then I moved on to university where I realised that physics and chemistry was actually much harder and not really where I wanted to be. And actually biology was the bit that was much more interesting. So yep. I really became a biologist at university um, and I just got sucked into cell biology at that point. And I was so fascinated by how does something that's effectively a bag of liquid that has the same genetic information how does it know to be a neuron or how does it know to be a blood cell or how does it know to be a muscle they've all got the same components and yet they're completely different things and how do they work together and why do they do the things that they do and that's really my lifelong love of biology and cells in general and how do they talk to each other and isn't that crazy and how does this <laughs> work out um so that's where I really started and then I I left university i wanted to move in with my boyfriend at the time and I came down to the Oxford area at that point and I joined a company called Avidex and I knew nothing about immunology but I was like well this sounds really cool it's a small startup company if this works I'll be laughing and I learned all my immunology on the job um, and I've been working with T-cells ever since I mean that was 20 years ago now and I'm still here you know been through various company iterations but I'm still here because the cells are fascinating and what we can do with them is fascinating. And the fact that we can use the immune system to treat patients, we can change their immune systems, we can give them those same cells from other sources. That's the fascinating part. But we're working on a living medicine. Who could not find that exciting and fascinating? Yeah. I'm totally sucked in and I always have been. It sounds like it. And I can understand where you're coming from because um, my background is biochemistry as well. And certainly nothing against physics or chemistry, they're fascinating topics. But when you start to dive into the human body, as you say, the fact that we're walking around functioning at all is incredible, yeah. given how complex we are. I absolutely, completely agree with that. And, you know, physics level complexity of the universe is just, yeah, that's mind blowing in a different way. And I'm just much more, my mind is around human biology, like how do humans function and why? It's amazing. It's amazing that we exist. Yeah, and we're making such big advances at the moment. So we'll come on to your technology in a second. But first of all, I've got to ask you, so your, your, your role title, um, Head of Allogeneic Research, can you just explain what that means? Because there's probably many people that don't understand that term. Yeah, absolutely. So I've moved around within the company quite a lot. And um, my latest view is working on stem cells. So allogeneic means that we give the patients a cell therapy that's made from a source external to the patient. So there are various different ways of doing it, but our one of our core competencies that adapt to mean where we started was taking patients' own cells and modifying them and giving them back. And that's called autologous. So where you use the cells from the patient to become the therapy for the patients. Um, but the work that I do now is trying to change that so that we can give them cells from a different source so that they don't have to go through that early procedure. So that's where the allogeneic part comes in. It just means that the cells don't come from the patient in origin, they come from some other place. Um, and so that's what my team is working on. Right. Yeah, and that totally makes sense because cell therapy, I mean, it's a really exciting new area, as you know well. But I guess that rate limiting step of getting the cells out of the patient, back in, we're starting to see these new approaches come through. So tell me a bit more about your exact approach. And you've got this Spear T-cell platform, which is a very cool name. Mm -hmm. But tell me a bit more about exactly how that works. So in the Spear T-cell platform, that relates to both the autologous, the patient-derived, and, and the allogeneic space. So that's about the T-cell receptor itself. So what we do there is, in a patient who's got cancer, their cancer will express different um, antigens, different markers on the surface of those cells. 
And the normal way that your body would recognize those is through your T-cell receptors. So your T-cells would be recognizing the tumor or not. I mean, and the fact that you have a cancer means that your T-cells aren't really up to the job. They haven't managed to recognize it and get rid of it. So the idea of the SPEAR platform is to take T-cell receptors that would recognize tumor antigens and make them higher affinity. So it stands for Specific Peptide Enhanced Affinity Receptor. So that's coming from the peptide part comes from the tumor itself that expresses bits of tumor on a molecule called HLA, so human leukocyte antigen, and that's the flag that the T cell is recognizing. And then the enhancing the affinity bit is the engineering that we do at Adaptamine to make those T cell receptors work better so they recognize the tumor more efficiently. And we can use those spear, those, those TCRs in either the patient autologous system or we can use them in the allogeneic system as well. And for those not so familiar with cell therapy, we talk about personalized medicine or precision medicine within cancer. But this form of cell therapy is really personalized to the individual and their tumor, isn't it? Um, so what we're doing um, at Adapt Immune is we're looking for tumor antigens that are expressed by lots of different people so that you can treat, you know, with the same receptor, the same sphere, you can treat multiple patients. But it does. You, the patient has to express the right antigen and the right HLA type to work with our, our therapy as the way things stand at the moment. So we're trying to broaden our platform as well. And we recently put some data out at ASGCT about our HIP platform, which is an HLA independent TCR. And that's, um, again, a different class of tumor antigen that should basically make the spears that we make in that context, uh, they're HLA independent, they would be more broadly applicable to more people. But you have to have the right tumor antigen to be eligible for the therapy, because if you don't have the right flag for the T cell to recognize, then we're not gonna be able to help you. Yeah. So it is definitely a personalized treatment. Um, and in the autologous space, because we use the patient's own blood cells to be part of the therapy, it's truly personalized. You know, you need to make sure that you take the cells from the patient, you give them the extra receptor and send them back. And it's vital that the patient gets the right cells. And it's a truly personalized experience yeah. at that point. And in terms of where this applies and types of cancer you can treat, is this universal or are there specific tumor types where this is more effective? So I, I think the field in general has started out in the hematological cancers because that's the easier space where, you know, the, the cells that you deliver, they get into the bloodstream straight away. So they're already at the site of where the tumor is. But our TCR therapies, our spears are showing they're working in solid tumors. And that's, I think, a real breakthrough for us and for the field in general. Being able to get into the solid tumor space is something that everybody wants to do. There's obviously massive unmet need there. And that's where, you know, the TCR platform, you know, seems to be working. And that's, I think, uh, a real bonus for us and for patients. And it's been a long time coming. I mean, I think everybody is wanting data in solid tumors. And we're at that stage now where we've we've got it with synovial sarcoma, myxoid round cell liposarcoma with our first um, our May day four program, a famotrestrine autolusol, which is known as a famicel, which is our first our May day four program. And I think, you know, we're very excited about it, about the data that we're getting in, in synovial sarcoma right now um, with the data that we put out for ASCO. Um, and this is, it's a huge thing for those patients with synovial sarcoma that we're managing to treat them with a living medicine with a T-cell receptor. Uh, yeah, and these sorts of approaches, I mean, they, they genuinely are offering hope where prior to this, there were very limited options, weren't there, for patients? Absolutely. I mean, and particularly in the synovial sarcoma space, there's very little treatment options. And I think you can see that in the way that clinicians and patients really want to come on to trials like this. You know, they are really looking for an option that gives them hope. Um, and it's I think it's really rewarding for us as scientists to see the, the impact that we're having on those patients. Um, and it really is. There's nothing else for them. I mean, synovial sarcoma is not well studied. It's not got a whole line of different chemotherapy agents that are approved in that indication. There really isn't much for these people. So a cell therapy that actually works is fantastic for them. And that's really something yeah. we have to build on. Yeah. And again, for those who are not familiar, just explain what synovial sarcoma is. So synovial sarcoma is, is a a cancer of the soft tissue. So it often forms in joints or often find it in the lung as well. Uh, and it's it's a disease of 
tends to be a more a younger age range with synovial sarcoma than a lot of cancers. Um, so it's impacting people earlier on in their lives. And it's traditionally, it's called a cold tumor type. So there are very little immune cells infiltrating. It's something that the immune system really doesn't see very well at all. So that's another really exciting fact that actually our T cells get into these tumors. So you can see them at the site of the disease. So you can see them getting in there and working on the tumor. Um, and that's something that is one of the hallmarks of cancer, actually trying to get your immune system into the right place to be able yeah. to actually have its effect. So that's one of the things that we need to break down with solid tumor treatment in general, is making sure the cells get to where they need to be. Yeah, yeah. And what about the complexities of taking something like this to market? Because as we discussed earlier, this is not as simple as somebody taking a pill or even a simple injectable chemotherapy. There's a bit more complexity involved here, isn't there? Yeah. So, I mean, I think you've got to be very tight on manufacturing, knowing how you get from patient to patient again, or that cycle going backwards and forwards. But you know, other companies have done it in the car space and we're following a path that's not entirely new. You know, people have done it. Um, we're using synovial sarcoma as an indication to build our company to get to commercial to, so that we've, we've spent our time building ourselves up to be a fully integrated company. And that includes the commercial um, point. We want to get a drug to market. That's what we're really working for with this lead indication for us. And it's a proof of concept. It's a proof of the TCR platform itself it's a proof of us as a company being able to get to this stage to be able to get to market um, and it's something that you know we really want to achieve and we're working very hard to do that. What about health systems because obviously as these novel therapies come through I guess it requires some adaptation from them and at the moment we've got specialists in different tumor types and I'm probably familiar with the older chemotherapies for example but how do they keep on top of these new treatments and do you see those systems shifting to adapt to them? I think we've seen a lot of shift in the past 15 years. I mean, when we started talking about ser therapy in the early days, people really didn't understand how this was going to work. Um, and I think you see the mix between, you know, there's there's a multiple reasons why the heme cancers were the first space for this to work. And one of them is that's where the transplant physicians are. That's where the people who understand HLA mismatch, who understand the immune system a bit better, they also sit in those departments. So that mix of transplant biology and immunology was it was easier to do in the heme space than it is in the solid tumors but I think you know because the big centers are involved and they're starting to see how well it's working we obviously have CD19 products on the market yep everybody wants that to apply to their cancer so clinicians are very interested they're very engaged centers are setting up that ability to cross talk between the different departments you find that hematologists are giving advice to people in other tumor areas because of their clinical experience and it is spreading and it's changing and the attitude to taking biopsies from patients is hugely different now than it was 10 years ago it's a very invasive procedure but mm -hmm. clinicians completely buy into our need to learn about these therapies and are they working in the way that we think they are? What are they doing for the patient? Are they making it to the right place? Yeah. Because I think the clinicians totally see that feedback loop of the translational information we get feeding back into better products and they've bought into that as a concept. And they're very keen because they want, you know, at the end of the day, a clinician wants to help their patients. They want to give exactly. them something that works. And they really see actually the learning, the iterative learning cycle with cell therapy and a living medicine is really part of the product development and it's all about getting better things for patients in the future yeah yeah and in terms of you know the reimbursement environment uh, do you see particular challenges there or again is that evolving in a kind of favorable direction uh i mean yes there are lots of challenges with cell therapy and we have to get that balance between cost and cure are we really curing patients how much are we extending their life and that's really where the allogeneic space comes in you know we want to make it work on the autologous side, and we absolutely believe that it can. We are going to market, yeah. we tend to go to market with autologous, but the reason that we've invested in the allogeneic, the off-the-shelf version, is that long-term, you know, people who crack that off-the-shelf, making it easier for patients, easier for clinicians, and bringing down the costs by manufacturing in bulk and making consistency, getting, you know, a consistent product that you can rely on batch-to-batch -batch where patients all receive the same treatment rather than, well, your cells weren't quite the same as your cells, so your product's a little bit different yeah, from yours. And yeah, yeah. how do we work out what's going on? That's where we have to go in the future as, as a field. And that's why, you know, I have a team working on it. That's why we've put the investment in, because that's where we see the future, the long-term future. 
Yeah. I do think allogeneic and autologous, they're going to go hand in hand for quite a long time as we learn one from the other. I mean, that's the best part about having both within adapt immune is my allogeneic team are constantly learning from the translation of information from the autologous system so that we're changing where we're aiming with our off the shelf products in light yeah. of patient data. Yeah. So it sounds like it's all about finding that balance point between personalization and therefore efficacy, but scalability. Absolutely. I think there's a it's a balance between consistency, yield and, you know, with every process, if you increase the yield, you can bring down costs over time. I mean, manufacturing improvements are they happen in every field. I mean, they've happened in the autologous space. You see the costs come down in terms of vector manufacture for these sorts of products. And the very fact that healthcare, um, you know, payers, they're looking at they're not just looking at a quick, do you fix, do you cure? They're looking at that cost over a prolonged, over a life, you know, effectively. Do you give them five years of good quality life? Well, that's a different equation to extending them by two months. And when you start to look at antibody treatments or chemotherapy treatments, you know, the cost of prolonged rounds and rounds and rounds of treatment, that does stack up over time. So if you can have a one shot treatment that works and gives you five years of life, then that value equation changes. And I think so cell therapy in general has really changed the way people think about payment and how we, you know, but we're not at the end of it, right? There's still a lot more conversation to have. There's a lot more to be done on making this pay and making it work. And it's, I mean, it's a very difficult role for those in the health systems. I certainly wouldn't want to be there myself trying to work out what is the value of quality of life or extension of life when obviously they've got they've got limited budgets but i mean what is very clear is the pace of innovation and the way things are accelerating we are seeing change and it's sometimes i think it's only when you look back and you think actually where we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago with cancer therapy you see actually how big that shift has been do you think that's accelerating do you think we're going to see some big leaps in the next 10 years or will it be a gradual evolution I think we are accelerating. I think when you look at what's out there on the market in terms of tools now, when you look at CRISPR editing tools, as well as the viral vectors, there are all these different ways of us being able to manipulate the genetics here. I think we are making leaps and bounds and we're doing it. Um, there's a lot, there's still a lot of things that we really don't know. And a lot of things we will only find out through that clinical iteration. But I think the world is much, I mean, patients as well, they're much more um, amenable. They want to take part in this sort of yeah. trial. They want to take ownership of their treatment plan and how they get help or not, you know. So people are in the internet age, they're looking at these trials. They're looking at what's out there. They're looking at the science. They're asking their doctors some difficult questions of like, I don't just want the standard chemo. I want something to work. I, I've looked at this and I've, you know, yeah. when you go to the doctor these days, you don't just accept exactly what they say it's a do-way conversation and everybody googles everything so i think that pressure from patients um, and advocacy groups is one thing the way we're building on our gene editing knowledge the way we can do sequencing now all of those things really help us do lots of different um lots of different approaches and that's really where the translational steering you know what can we learn from the patients that value really brings those two things together yeah. And that learning process, we're getting faster. Um, and I think you know, the technology that we have, the ability to look at single cells and look at their RNA and say they're expressing this or they're not doing this, you know, we're finding out so much more. And that's really where the autologous cell products, why does one person cure their cancer and another person not? You know, is it about their starting cells? Is it about the receptor? Is it about their tumor? You can really ask those questions in a much more detailed way these days than you could even even two years or five years ago, you know, yeah. and that's just, that keeps on going. We're, we're almost in the age where we struggle to deal with all of the knowledge. There's just too much information and how you pull out the right things is like one of the next challenges. Yeah. And that's tricky for the doctors as well. You know, that dynamic has changed with the patients and, you know, we all know Dr. Google can be quite a scary uh, place Absolutely. sometimes, Yeah. but I think the more informed the patients are, and, and as you're saying, they are, the healthier that dialogue and that joint treatment decision making. So yeah, I agree. Alongside the treatments, that, that's been a big, big change. So let's come back to Adapt Immune and think about your next few years. What are your big milestones? What are you kind of looking at on the radar in terms of can't wait to get to that point? So I mean, I think the big thing for me um, is our 
our Afamacel product because we are at that stage where we're hoping to file a BLA next year. And for us as a company, I like I was still a scientist doing lab work and I've worked on that in the lab preclinically. And now we're at the stage where this is potentially on the verge of becoming a commercial product. Now that yeah. for me personally is amazing. I mean, and for the company as well. I mean, it's, we've grown from, you know, five people up to more closer to 500 to be able to do that, but it's, it's such a rite of passage. Um, so that is, and that's a, such a big thing to be able to treat those synovial sarcoma patients who have nothing else, you know, it's not the biggest indication, but it means so much to those people. Um, and that is something that is really inspiring, actually, to be able to see what we're doing there. And then the next two things that I'm really excited about is my own allogeneic off the shelf platform, but also the HIP platform, you know, being able to get TCRs to work in a new way being able to truly see whether the TCR signaling mechanism that we use, which is different to the CARs, you know, the chimeric antigen receptors, they bolt different things together. We're using physiology in a different way. You know, actually, which is the best option? Is it, you know, for different targets, it probably, there's a different balance that you need there. And so fine tuning those and actually trying to answer some fundamental changes in the biology how is it best to make a T-cell work? Our HIP platform will allow us to ask some of those questions because you can go for the same targets that cars can go for. So the mesothelian HIP program that we put some data out, you know, we, we've looked at it against some of our competitor, you know, targets, but also you have truly their uh, basics of cars and the basics of TCRs and you can stack them up against each other and see actually how does the T-cell itself really work to the best of its ability? Um, and that's also where the allogeneic platform is really exciting because you're we're using stem cells as the basis and we're differentiating them into t-cells so that kind of what actual phenotype are we aiming for is it exactly the same as an adult t-cell or actually the fact that we're using a younger phenotype might be better you know there are lots of how and there's so many options for fine tuning and affecting the biology in light of what we know this is yeah. why i find this really exciting because this is that cycle between patients and what we're trying to do in the lab we can really respond to what we learn from the patients and there's so many with the way that you know dna gene editing all of the, that technology right now there are so many options that that's a really exciting space to be in how can we navigate that stay ahead of the game and make sure that we deliver cells that really treat everybody and get those you know response numbers up how do we make this work for everyone and that's you know that's the ideal dream of making a t-cell product that we can rely on to work for the majority of people yeah yeah well certainly hope you, you can achieve that and I've got to ask you and it's still very topical COVID unfortunately although I hope we are now emerging What's been the impact? Because it does impact things like clinical trials. You don't have the big conference get togethers where there's often a lot of information sharing. So have you seen much of an impact on from that on your work? I think COVID has impacted the company in lots of different ways. I mean, from the supply issue of being able to get hold of plasticware to do experiments is one thing. You know, lots of companies are prioritizing COVID related things for very good reason, you know. Um, and it it's it's a strange state of affairs to be told that as a cancer researcher well actually you know you're, you're not first in the queue you're way down there actually because this is more important and and rightly so um it's also been about the way we've had to change the way we work as scientists in the lab you know we've had to spread people out we've changed the shift pattern but actually the team has worked really well with the hybrid mix of in person what we can do online these days the fact that we can have conversations like this over zoom rather than actually having to physically be in the same place has been amazing I think your point about conferences is right you know actually people aren't going to as many and even when you do there's a lot of listening and not so much of the questioning you know so when you do a poster yeah. session online you can upload your spiel everybody can see it so everybody more people probably get to see what you want to say but you don't get the same question you don't get that same back and forward interaction and that I think is I, I do think um, conferences will go back to that face-to-face -face component because there is something really missing there, um, the ability to all get together and really discuss things in real time. But, you know, we've worked remarkably well despite that. And I think one of the nice things about COVID is that it actually 
the way governments and scientists have been working together, the way that data has been shared, it's been a much more open process with the, com with the world at large. You know, people have seen science in a different way rather than those weird people yeah. who are shut away in a lab with white lab coats. We don't know what they're doing or we'd like to like, like, trust them. <laughs> you know, that whole dialogue between scientists and people is on a different plane now, which I think can only yeah. be a good thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping that we preserve a lot of that as we come out of COVID and that we keep that scientific conversation going in the general public. Yeah. Yeah. People, as you say, realising, you know, the power of science and what it can achieve, as we've seen in the last year, when there's that, that real drive and, and support to, to do things quickly. And, you know, what about the relationship between academia and industry? Because I think back to I think we were doing our PhDs around the same time, so late 90s. And at that stage, it felt like there was a bit of a divide. You're either academia or you're industry, but it feels like that's really come together now. So how do you see that play out in your work? Uh, so I think a lot of the people that we need in like the allergenetic space, particularly, there's nobody who's got good industry experience of a lot of this stuff because it hasn't been done yet. So, no. you know, a lot of it, it does rely on academic thought and it is though it is a it's I guess quite an academic process but with an industrial focus of the patient at the end and how are we actually going to translate this from our great blue sky thinking ideas that we've got over here how do we get them into the clinic and that's so it is a hybrid mix of people who've got industry experience of how to take you know say an antibody drug you know all the way forward versus people who understand basic immunology and even you know stem cell field is very academic at the moment still you know we haven't made that breakthrough into what is a truly you know industrial manufacturing process there are lots of pioneers doing different approaches doing different bits and pieces yep. solving small parts of that puzzle but to get to patients you need to combine all of those together so you need to get that mix and i think it's actually quite a healthy mix it's something that i really like i am uh you know, I came straight from academia into biotech, but we've um, the company, you know, Avidex and, and Adaptive Immune still, we've maintained a bit of an academic feel in some areas. You know, obviously you have to be focused on the projects. You have to be focused on making sure that you're making the right progress and stuff. But there is that creativity around bringing in academic ideas because that's how we're going to find the future at the moment. Yeah. If we don't have it. It's not it's not an industry churning the handle job at the moment. It is. It is. You've got to take that inspiration from all different branches of science and I think that's one of the nice things for me for moving from immunology and stem cell is you see there's a whole lot of dogma in stem cell that I didn't know I needed to know so I wasn't hampered by that in terms of thinking how these things could work also there was a lot of stuff I was completely naive about and it was harder than I thought but you know that mix of different disciplines is much more common these days and yeah. you see that with the gene editing you know again there's lots of interesting brilliant ideas coming in from academia that industry needs to take note of and actually use and i think um academia is much wiser to that now you know the ability to protect their ip but also to license it because they know that protecting it without actually people making use of it is worthless to them as well you know so i think yeah. in academia has really come around to what industry can do with them and that partnership is is definitely evolving for the better i think yeah, well, and it comes back to, I think, what you mentioned at the start, that curiosity, isn't it? Kind of not being so obsessed with where this is going that it stops you from actually walking down that path and seeing what comes out of it, which I think is hugely important. In terms of partnerships, are there any specific partnerships that you're really excited about at the moment? Um, so we've got a great partnership with uh, CCIT uh, in Denmark on a TIL programme. So this is a, a, a complete change of direction for us at ADAPT, I mean, we're not actually looking at the T cell receptors there, we're not changing the affinity of those, which was, you know, our core technology from before, but we're using our next generation immunology knowledge with their academic knowledge of TILS and we're combining the two together. And that's a really kind of great diversion of trying to make the best of our immunology understanding that we've learned through our SPEAR platform and combining it with a TIL platform where you can treat anybody that you can grow the tills from. So again, that balance between how many people you can treat versus the real personalized TCRs where you're cutting down to the, the right antigen. With a till platform, you don't need to know the antigen, you just go with whatever the patient gives you within their T cell repertoire. And then we're using our immunology to 
boost that um, signal and hopefully give them back a better product than just a till expansion protocol on its own. So that's a really nice um, partnership between us and academia. And I think there should be a lot more of, of this to come in the future where you're taking the best of an academic idea, um, taking the best of an academic research centre and combining it with industry and that different angle, we can certainly, there'll be make great strides made there across, across the field if, if we continue to do those sorts of partnerships. So I was going to ask you about you know, the future, next 10 or 20 years, which is one of those real crystal ball questions. But before I get there, just wondered if you had any kind of you know, personal stories about the impact you've seen of your science, obviously not saying to name names or anything like that, but typically you, know, you might have seen somebody in a clinical trial that's had a big impact. Any of those kind of personal stories that have really hit home for you? So I think, um, you know, I like to think about our NYUSO program, which we licensed out to GSK a long time ago. I'm like, that clone that we got the original TCR was in my lab book. That's really cool. Um, but watching that, you know, go through the program that it was to the partnership that we had with GSK, that's the reason they did the partnership with us in the first place. And yes, you know, we had to give it to them, but actually it's gone on and it's treated lots of different patients. It's gone on in the next gen version. And you kind of, to watch the evolution of that TCR as well, because we didn't know how to make it into the best drug. We went through all these protein drug iterations. We linked it to lots of different things. How are we going to, it was all part of the evolution of T-cell therapy itself as mm. well. Um, so that's a really kind of big one. I'm kind of sad that we don't still own it, but obviously that's part of the story. You know, we wouldn't exist without yeah. it. And, you know, we wouldn't exist without that deal that we did with GSK, which was exactly the right thing for us to do at the time um you know and hindsight's a wonderful thing in biotech but you've got to you've got to roll with those things and see the value in them and you know it's uh it's part of who we are and the fact that it lives on is the important part the fact that it goes on to treat patients and will continue to do so and you know they're looking to broaden indications we're looking to broaden indications so we all want yeah. to treat more people um so i mean those are the really exciting ones the stuff that i was personally involved with a long time ago watching them actually come to fruition but watching the whole field come to fruition as well i mean there was a time with our afp program in, in liver cancer where i went to a liver congress uh, a long time ago and i stood there with a tcr poster and they're like what is even this like what are you doing at this conference this is crazy you know you know this 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 whole idea of targeting afp with a tcr that's just going to kill people there's no way this is going to happen and yet here we are where it is happening and we are testing it. And, you know, there were lots of barriers to overcome. And it goes back to your point earlier of those clinicians at the time when we started that program, they weren't ready for this at all. You know, the liver doctors were like, you can go away with your crazy ideas. I don't want to be part of it. And yet now, you know, this is another evolution, different indication, different way, different problems, you know, different target, completely different in lots of different ways. Yeah. Um, and all of those things are, but well, they kind of bring us to where we are. And that's the bit that I love actually is reacting to what we know and looking for the new opportunities. I mean, that's why I've moved around the company the way I have. That's why I'm in the allergenetic space now. It's like, oh yeah, well, what if we could do that? That would be so cool, wouldn't it? I mean, that's the inspirational bit for me. And I've been lucky that they keep on letting me do it. You know, <laughs> they keep on <laughs> letting me do the next new thing. Yeah. Um, but watching cell therapy, you know, when CD19 cars hit the BBC News, for example, you're like, this is like normal people. You can talk to somebody in the pub about CD19 car and, you know, 99% of people will know what you're talking about. They'll have mm -hmm. heard of it. You go, oh, you remember this? Oh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. no, I've heard about that. And to see where we were like 10 years ago, you know, for that actually to be so mainstream and, and so, as well understood as it is, you know, we've still got a long way to go. But it's, that's an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you're giving people options where, as you know, really a few years ago, there were, there were none, um, which we must be huge. About, yeah, we talk about cures regularly now, that, that thought that we can cure people hmm. and people believe that we will get there, you know, rather than they believe, well, you're crazy, we can't talk about curing. But, you know, we are at that point where maybe we can, you know, maybe we can cure a lot of people and that really changes the whole what cancer means, you know, getting a cancer diagnosis is such a depressing, awful thing. And it's still horrible. Nobody wants to be told that they have cancer. 
but they have so many more options now than they did five or ten years ago you know yeah. there are it's a different conversation now rather than the complete your life is over which is how yeah. lots of people used to view it yeah well that, that's where I kind of wanted to, to finish the discussion was that you know play that ahead maybe 20 years or so, I guess, within our working careers. And people do talk about cure for cancer. And then very often people say, oh, we're never going to get a cure for cancer because it's lots of different diseases, et cetera. But it sounds like we are heading in that direction, at least in some tumours. So where do you think we'll be in 20 years time with cancer therapy? I mean, I really think we will be curing some cancers. I'm not saying we're going to cure all cancers because like say, it's it's millions of different diseases. It's so yep. personal. But I think, you know... I think that hope is there and I think it, it's real. I think the way that patients and doctors interact with scientists now and that research, you know, those pioneers in the field of bench to bedside research and that cycle, you know, we've changed the way people think about this and people, patients are almost demanding it now in a way that they weren't before. It is a society conversation of, you know, we want to treat people we want to be able to pay for it. We need to make this whole system work. And, you know, I think that's one of the differences in, you know, different geographies of where people think palliative care is the right answer versus aggressive treatment. Yeah. Those are becoming global conversations. And this is the thing, people are changing their minds. You know, countries are taking different stances on where they have been historically. And I think the science fuels all of that. But I also think it's, that's a fragile relationship and it is on us as scientists to make sure we really do the right thing and we keep that trust that people have in us at the moment and we can only do that by making sure we do everything to the best of our ability and being truly open with what we're doing and all of the safety uh, testing and the way that that's evolving I think people need to see us learning I mean and that's been something that Adapt Immune has always done I mean we've published our problems as well as our successes and that to me personally is one of the key reasons that I'm still here is because that ethos of who we are warts and all for good or for bad for the everybody needs to understand when something's gone wrong you know we published uh, some seminal papers you know way back in on, on our May Day 3 program of like we found this toxicity and this is what it means um, so many different companies in the field still reference those papers because it changed the way we think about safety and yeah. that's i think the most important thing we need to make sure that we we do this in a safer way as possible um but we need to take those that risk you know balance for for these patients because they are they don't have options and they want options so you know getting that risk balance right is what we need to do yeah, no, that, that, that's fantastic. Well, you know, to your point there, keep being curious, keep learning. And that that collective effort, as you describe, it is it is making a difference. So wish you every continued success in your work. And, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It's been really, really fascinating. Thank you, Joe. No, that's great. Thanks very much.